it's coming. It's ready. Okay, so now we get that hand shot. Let's do that right there. One, two, three. There we go. That's it. Sneak preview. Cute little baby turtle. No one's here yet. They can't see it. Just waiting for people to get here. Just waiting for people to get here. Why don't you tell us a joke? I don't have any jokes. Oh, why don't you ask me, uh, do you have any jokes? No. You don't have any jokes? No. Do you know any knock-knock jokes? Knock-knock. Come in. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, Helen. Hey, Krista. Nice to see you, Miss Helen. Nice chatting with you on the phone the other day. <laughs> oh, you saw you saw the turtle, huh? <laughs> that little turtle Miss Krista is going to be making today. I am not going to be making a balloon today. Miss Krista is. So, I hope everybody's doing good. I hope everybody is staying healthy. Mentally, physically, spiritually, and just getting ready to do a Bible study. I'm going to wait a minute. I'm going to wait a minute, and then we'll get into the study. Nice to see you, Miss Cindy. Nice to see you at the Bible study. Nice to see you, Miss Cindy. And let's see, what did we talk about last time in the Bible study? We talked about the kingdom of God inside of you. And the kingdom of God inside of you is living by the principles of God's kingdom here on earth. When you do that, you are living the kingdom of God inside of your heart. Okay, so I guess we might as well get started. We don't want to, um, I guess we don't want to wait too long to get started, so... Uh, you know the same old story. We're going to do a Bible study. We're going to do a balloon. And today's topic is going to be the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Hmm. Are they all in the New Testament? And what does that have? What is that? What are the implications for us as we ponder these things? So as we get started, I'm going to ask my beautiful wife, would you come and pray with me? So let's get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for another moment to do Bible study, to get into your word, and to seek your face and your will. So as we pray, Heavenly Father, we want to ask that you would forgive us of our sins. If we have done anything from the last time we've prayed to this point, that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us and purge us, and that you would make us like your son, Jesus. As we move forward, Lord, we ask a special blessing of protection uh, that you would guard our hearts, guard our minds, and help us to uh, stay focused, to get ready as we live in these serious times, that you would fortify our hearts and our minds with your word, and that you would raise us up to be people who stand for truth and worship you in truth and spirit. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to ask a special blessing over everyone who's here. Help us, Lord, to take these uh, warnings that you give us seriously. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so here we go. Hey, Miss Jen. Hey, Becky. Hey, Carol. Nice to see you all. We're about to get into some Bible study. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Now, this is a very, very, for me, very important uh, subject because if you did the Bible study last time, which was called the kingdom of God in you, we saw that when Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he goes on to say that the kingdom of God is in us. And we looked at the Holy Scriptures, and what we saw was that by living by God's principles, we can display as ambassadors for Christ the kingdom of God within us. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and see the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. And this is a funny subject because in this world today, it's almost as if these Ten Commandments have been relegated to the side and they don't mean anything more in a big sense to a lot of people in the Christian world. So as we move forward, let's go into the Bible and look at a story 
And this story is going to show us what happens when we take something that's holy and do something unclean with it. So we're going to go to Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. That's Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to see what happens when we take something holy and do something wrong with it. So Daniel chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. A little background here. Nebuchadnezzar had besieged and sacked Jerusalem. He had um, demolished the temple, and he had taken the nation of uh, Israel, specifically Judah and Benjamin, captive. And as time goes by, Nebuchadnezzar passes away. His son takes the throne. And as his son takes the throne, he hands off his uh, rights and duties as king to his son. Because uh, Nebuch uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son actually took on the role of a high priest. So here we see the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar ruling Babylon. And this is what happens. So we're, as I say, Belshazzar. This is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And this is what it says. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold, vets, the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the gold vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and stone. And after this happened, the judgment of God fell upon Belshazzar. What Belshazzar did, he took the holy things that were dedicated to the service of God, and he did not show respect unto them, and he did what he wanted with them in an unclean way, in a way that dishonored God, and for that the judgment of God fell upon Belshazzar. Now, this is just the jumping point where we want to start, because what we're going to see is when we take the holy things of God, without respecting them and do whatever we want with them, we see that we dishonor God, and the judgment of God will fall upon us. So, we're going to look and see where the Ten Commandments are in the New Testament. And we're going to start here in Matthew 5, 17 to 19. And I just want to say hello to my nephew, Ian, who is awesome. I miss you, buddy, and I'm proud of you. Okay, so we're going to look at the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. And right off the bat, this is what we're going to see what Jesus says himself about the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Matthew 5, 17 through 19 says this. Matthew 5, 17 through 19 says this. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. These are the words of Jesus Christ concerning the law. And he goes on in the very first verse to say, in verse 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Each one of the sets of laws that were in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law, the moral law, the dietary law, and the health law, Jesus did not come to destroy those, but he came to fulfill them. And he did fulfill them. He never sinned. He never broke a commandment. He fulfilled the ceremonial law as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And this is what he says in verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law 
till all be fulfilled. So have heaven and earth passed yet? Heaven and earth have not passed yet. So according to Jesus' own words, that the law will not pass away until heaven and earth pass away. And this is what he goes on to say. Verse 19, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what we want to do is we want to teach the world that salvation is through Jesus Christ and that by him crucified, we have the privilege to have our sins forgiven. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, what we're doing is we're, exceeding, we're saying that I believe what Jesus did for me was right. And as an act of obedience, I want to do what's right in his eyes. And the only way to do that is to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to do that. It's very important. We need Jesus for salvation, and we need the Holy Spirit for obedience. Now, let's look and see what the Psalms have to say, because Jesus himself here said, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Heaven and earth shall not pass away, and the law will still be in effect. But let's go to the book of Psalms and see what the book of Psalms has to say. Psalm 89, verse 34. That's the book of Psalms, chapter 89, verse 34. This is what it says. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If the Lord was going to change something, he would have told us. Now imagine God taking his finger, writing in stone the Ten Commandments. That's a very important thing. God did not have Moses do that. God did not have an angel do that. God saw that that was so important that he knew that that was a job that only he could do. And he didn't have a man write it down. He wrote it down himself in stone because stone lasts forever. And this, God says, I will not break nor alter the thing that has come from my lips. So the principles that are found in the Ten Commandments are the very principles of God's eternal kingdom. And he will never change them. Now, let's go into the New Testament and see where the Ten Commandments are. Because in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, God gives us a list Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. He gives them to Moses, and Moses comes down on the mountain in Sinai. In the New Testament, God did not repeat that because as Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, that was an established fact. But God knew that down the ages, deception would take place, and people would say that the laws of God have been done away with because of a misunderstanding of Scripture. So let's go and see if we can find where God um, preserved the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. So the first commandment is worship God only. So let's go to Matthew 4.10 and then Revelation 19.10. And we're going to see what the New Testament has to say about the first commandment. Matthew 4.10. Here we go, Matthew 4.10. Matthew 4.10, and here we go. Matthew 4.10. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So in the New Testament, worship God only. Revelation 19.10. Revelation 19.10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Here John is in vision, and he sees this being, and it's obviously not clear to him who this being is because he falls down at his feet to worship. 
This is an angel that is obedient to God. And as John gives him reverence, the first thing that the angel says is this. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So here, commandment number one, two places in the scriptures we can see that clearly it says, keep the first commandment. The second commandment is not to commit idolatry. And so we're going to go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. That's 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. And this is what it says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. It says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. So thou shalt not have any idols. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, keep yourself from idols. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. And what we're doing is we're going through the New Testament to see the Ten Commandments. Not only are they still there and valid, but we're going to see that they have the same power and authority that they did in the Old Testament. Each one of them. Each one of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14 says this, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, flee from idolatry. Now we're going to see, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Commandment number three in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, here it goes. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let us, as many servants as are under the yoke, those who, us, who are under Christ's yoke, count their masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So here it is clearly said, for those servants who are under a earthly master, that we reverence them and give them respect, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So our actions, we have to be very careful that our actions do not blaspheme the name of God. That is the third commandment. Now, this is number four commandment. We're going to hold this one for very last. So we're not skipping it and taking it out of the picture. What we're going to do is save it for last and give it an extra minute. Because if you know this commandment, you know that this is the very commandment that is the critical point and contention in the Christian world. So we're going to take the fourth commandment, we're going to hold off till last, and we're going to go to the fifth commandment. Honor thy parents. Matthew 19, 19. Matthew 19, 19. Here we go. Honor thy parents. Matthew 19, 19. And it says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So here Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler, You know the commandments. And Jesus says, Jesus says, honor thy mother and thy father. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And ye fathers, oh, I'm sorry, that ye may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Honor thy mother and thy father. It's very clear up to this point. Do not kill. Romans, th Romans 13, 19. I'm sorry, Romans 13, 9. 
Here we go. Do not kill. Romans 13, 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. That is the rest of the commandments. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We are not saved by keeping the law. The law does nothing but reveal to us what sin is. But shall we continue in sin? God forbid. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. The opposite side of the coin is that once we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we, a Lord has rules. Any earthly king has rules. And if you come under allegiance of that king, then by definition, as his servant, you will be obedient to him. It's no different with the heavenly king. If we accept him as Lord and Savior, by definition, a Lord has rules. And those rules are the Ten Commandments. Now, we just saw the entire list of the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. We are going to continue on with a few more. James chapter 2, verse 11. Thou shalt not kill. James chapter 2, verse 11. And I know that this is a very funny topic for Christians because what happens is as soon as you hear somebody say, oh, you're, you're telling us to keep the law, that's works. It has nothing to do with works. It has everything to do with obedience. This is not a salvation issue. This is a this is an obedience issue. And as we are in that great deception, we're at the end of time. The mark of the beast and the Antichrist are at the around the corner. And he's going to trick the world into thinking that we have to follow his set of rules. Unless we're fortified in our hearts and mind with the word of God, we will be deceived and receive the mark of the beast. James chapter 2. Verse 11, thou shalt not kill. James 2, 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if thou commit adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Do not kill. No adultery. Matthew 19, 18. We're just about done with these. Matthew 19, 18. Okay, here we go. Matthew 19, 18, no adultery. This is what it says. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, Thou shalt not do murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. So, as we go along with these scriptures, we are seeing that the Ten Commandments not only are in the New Testament, but we're seeing that Jesus himself referred us to obedience to God by the Ten Commandments. Now, here we go. We're going to do no stealing now. And we're going to go back to Romans 13, 9. Romans 13, 9. Romans 13, 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and there shall, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How many of us want our neighbors to steal from us? How many of us want our neighbors to lie about us? How many of us want our neighbors to kill us? None of us want that. And it says, if, it says for us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So if we don't want our neighbors to do those things to us, we should not do those things to our neighbors. And that's how we will love our neighbors as ourselves. The same way we want to be treated is the same way we should treat people. Okay, so no stealing, no lying. And now we've gone through eight of the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to go to the final commandment and then go back and look at the, the fourth commandment. And we're going to see here in Romans 7, 7, it says, Thou shalt not covet. 
Romans 7.7. 7. This is what it says, Romans 7.7. 7. What shall we then say? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. What Paul is here is saying, is the law sin? Is knowledge of the law sin? No. What sin is, is what the law does. It reveals to us what sin is. And without the law, we would not know what obedience is. I would not know that I was a sinner unless the law was there. So it was necessary for us to know that I am a sinner by having the law there. Does that make the law sin? It does not. The law simply reveals to us what sin is. And I did not know that it was wrong to be greedy unless the law of God said so. And so this is very important. We see every single one of the, new command, uh, new, uh, the commandments of God in the New Testament. The only one we didn't look at is the fourth commandment. We're about to do that right now. And this is the boiling point when it comes to Christian walk, right? Because we can all agree on the fact that we shouldn't lie, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't kill, we shouldn't murder, we shouldn't take God's name in vain, we shouldn't do all of these things. The fourth commandment is where the Christian world has the real issue with the commandments of God. And because they don't want the fourth commandment, they're willing to throw out all ten just to remove the fourth. And I want you to understand something. I'm not pushing anything. There's no hidden agenda here. There is no denomination or belief system that I'm trying to push. I'm simply trying to show in the word of God that if you love me, keep my commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. In completion, it's time for us to get obedient to, the, to what God wants us to do. It's time to come out of any false system that would have us do the traditions of man. And what we want to know is what is God's calling for us? And that is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and then come into an obedient relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the fourth commandment. What is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is Exodus chapter 8 verse 11. I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11. And this is what it says. Remember the seventh day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy stranger, nor thy cattle that is um, within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fourth commandment, the seven-day rest. This is the one commandment that has been thrown in the garbage, and this is the one thing that we really, if we're looking for 100% obedience to Christ, we really need to self-evaluate. Are we like that ancient Babylonian king who took the holy things of God and did whatever we want with them? Are we that kind of person where God commanded for these things to be used a certain way and we don't have reverence for God or his word and we throw it out? Let's see what the New Testament has to say about the fourth commandment. Let's see. Because was, was the New Testament clear about all the other commandments? It was. Is the New Testament clear about the fourth commandment? It is. We're going to go to, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, 27 and 28. And this is going to be our starting point. Luke chapter 2, 27 and 28. This is what it says. Luke chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Hmm. I'm sorry. 
Mark chapter 2. I don't know why I had that stuck in my head. Mark chapter 2. This is what it says. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. I apologize about that wrong scripture. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He is the Son of God. And if you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says that Jesus is the Word, and that the Word was with God, and that the Word was God, and that all things were made by the Word of God. So if all things were made by the Word of God, that means Jesus is the Creator. In those six days of creation, when the seventh day came, Jesus is the one who commanded the seventh day rest. That was Jesus. If Jesus is creator, he is the one that put his finger down on the tablets of stone on Mount Sinai and with his own hand wrote the fourth commandment. That was Jesus. This is why he says, therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Because Jesus created the Sabbath, Jesus wrote it with his own finger in the table of stone. So when it says this, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It is not said that the Sabbath was made for the Jew and the Jew for the Sabbath. Here Jesus is saying that the Sabbath was made for man, for all of mankind. When was the Sabbath instituted? At creation. Who was the one that was there when the Sabbath was first instituted? Adam. Why did God say in the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath? Because time and time again throughout history, the Sabbath had been forgotten. Because time and time again, as we become disobedient, we tend to take our hearts and minds off of God. That's why the Sabbath commandment starts out with remember. Time and time again, Sabbath was instituted in creation. When God gave the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, he said to remember this. And Jesus said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath because he created the Sabbath in the seventh day at creation. And he's the one who took his finger and wrote on the tablets of stone. So Jesus is the authority when it comes to the Sabbath. Let's go and see the final conclusion of the matter. Because there's a scripture in the Bible about the Sabbath, and it seals the deal, right? We can go back and forth and look at all these scriptures and say, well, here, 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 this, this, this is contention, this is contention, this is something I don't understand. This is the ultimate final authority. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. Now remember, people don't want this commandment. They want to throw this commandment in the garbage. But Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them. And he who is obedient to me, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Okay, so here we go. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. This is what it says. Hebrews 4, 3 through 11. And it says this, For we which have believed do enter into rest. So the believers enter into a rest. As he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. So we're talking about the fourth commandment. We're talking about the seventh day Sabbath. Now, don't let your tradition trip you up. We have a tradition. Don't let that trip you up. Don't be that person that Jesus says, but in vain do you worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We don't want to be those people. 
he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, then, he, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore there remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. We're talking about the seventh-day Sabbath here. It specifically says in Hebrews 4, 3 through 11, we're talking about the seventh-day Sabbath. And in verse 9 it says, There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. If Jesus had given them rest, then afterward he, have would, he would have told us if it was another day. Nowhere in, the te nowhere in the Holy Scriptures does Jesus say that the Sabbath was changed. Nowhere. The sanctity, the holiness that God instituted at creation in the seventh day Sabbath has never been changed. The Sabbath was held in creation. Jesus held the Sabbath for the first 300 years of Christianity the entire Christian world held the Sabbath and it goes on to say in the kingdom of heaven that we will also keep the Sabbath in the new heavens and the new earth so in the past in the present in the future Sabbath is still important it's still viable it still has value because if Jesus had changed the day he would have told us Hebrews 4 8 that's the end of the story it literally says that if Jesus would have changed the day he would have told us now a lot of us have these traditions that hold us back from following God a lot of us have businesses that hold us back from following God and I'm going to challenge you that stuff is over we're at the point of final deception and unless we get our lives right with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit we can walk in perfect obedience because Jesus says if you love me keep my commandments it says that here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus it says blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Jesus said not one jot nor one title shall disappear from the law. And so we looked into the New Testament and what we saw was this, that every single commandment is still viable. Not because of works. We're not talking about doing works. That can be something that gets stuck in our heart. I'm doing this because I'm earning points in heaven. There is no point system in heaven. But to avoid the coming deception, and it's coming, the, com the deception is coming. It's here. The only way to do that is to enshrine the principles of God's kingdom in your heart. And if you enshrine the principles of God's kingdom in your heart, you will not be deceived. It's going to be a difficult situation that we have to get through. We need to fortify our minds and our hearts with the Word of God. We need to let go of any man-made tradition that holds us back from doing that. It is time to repent of our sins and be converted, that our sins may be blotted out. We went through the Ten Commandments. We saw each one was viable, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, because it specifically said if Jesus would have changed the day, he would have told us. Let's look at a scripture and see how important it is that we as God's people are obedient 
to Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to do what God wants us to do. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. That's the book of Daniel 7, verse 25. Daniel verse 7, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. We're talking about the Antichrist here. We're talking about that being that is around the corner that has a great deception for us and he's looking to trick us. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And it says this, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time's times and the dividing of time. This little horn power is the Antichrist. And it says that he speaks great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And this is what the Antichrist's plan is. He shall think to change times and laws. Is this talking or referring to any man-made laws? Or is this referring to God's law? Does the Antichrist want to change human law or God's law? Does it matter in God's eyes, if human laws change, it doesn't. It means nothing because they change all the time. What matters is if the Antichrist deceives God's people and causes them to become disobedient by deception. And it says, he shall think to change times and law. Is there a time in God's law? Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. That is a time in the law. The Antichrist's purpose is to trick us and deceive us so that we will turn our backs on obedience to God. Remember we talked about Belshazzar and how he had taken the holy things from God's temple, showed them no respect, and did what he wanted with it, and the judgment of God fell upon him. So too, God has given us the holy Ten Commandments. If we show them no respect and do what we want with them, then the judgment of God will fall upon us too. Because not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the will of God? To be obedient through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's the, only the Holy Spirit is going to make it possible to do that. It's only through the Holy Spirit are we able to have that change of heart Right, Because God says, I give you a new mind and a new heart. It's only the Holy Spirit that's able to do that. And when God gives us a new mind and a new heart, we fall in love with God and we want to do what's right in his eyes. So, we know what happens to those who have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. They enter in through the gates into the city of New Jerusalem. But what happens to those who choose not to do God's will? I know this is a tough subject. I know this is a hard one. I know it. We're going to go to Isaiah 66, 17. Isaiah 66, 17. Here we go. Isaiah 66, 17. Check this out. Isaiah 66, 17 says this. They that, hear this, they that sanctify themselves, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens, behind one tree, in the mists. You know what? Let's go back another verse. Let's go to 15. This is what it says. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. When is that? That is the day and hour of judgment. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots, his angels, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with the flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, by his word, Will the Lord plead with all flesh? The Lord is pleading with us right now. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. Many will die. And this is the point. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves 
in the gardens behind one tree, in the mists, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination, the mouse. They shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. This is the point. They that sanctify themselves, they that purify themselves, do we have the ability to sanctify ourselves? Do, sanctified means being made holy. Do we have the power to do that? We do not. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves, do we have the power to turn our minds and hearts to purity? We do not. And so we see here a glimpse into the minds and hearts of people at the end times. They think they have the ability to sanctify themselves and to purify themselves. That is impossible. The only way to be sanctified and to be purified is by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through the power of Jesus Christ. When we have this mind frame where I got this, I can do this, this is something that I'm doing, that's works. So when we take God's law and we say, I don't need to adhere to that, that's the same spirit as Antichrist because it's Antichrist who thinks to change the times and laws of God. And when you think that you can change the times and laws of God, you begin to walk down the road where you're saying that I make myself holy. I don't need God to make me holy. I don't need God to purify me. I have the wisdom and ability within myself to do that. And it says that those who have that mind frame will be consumed. And this is one of the reasons why this subject is so important. Because the great deception is coming upon us. And as the power of the government is twisting and pressing us and to a point where we have to listen to them or we will be cut off from all worldly advantage, it is only going to be God who is able to be able to get us through these things. And so we need to surrender our hearts to Jesus. We need to ask him for the Holy Spirit so that we can be obedient and keep his commandments. And when we do these things, whatever the government, whatever the Antichrist or future power has in store for us, it won't even matter. We would rather die than fight. And so this is my challenge to you. Really research these things. See what God is going to impress upon your heart and really take the challenge to walk in a new way with Jesus of total and complete obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit because the time is short. The time of preparation is very short. So I just challenge you, use this time valuable. Get that TV off. Get off of Facebook for a little bit and get into that word. Spend some time in the word and ask God to change your heart because we want to be ready as this great deception comes. We don't want to fall for it. So thank you very much for coming. Me and my wife, we're going to pray now and we're going to ask that you would join us in prayer. Keep me and uh, my wife in your prayer because the Lord's got a mighty work to do in our hearts too. And... Uh, we're going to be praying for you guys too. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege and honor that we have to know you, to have Bibles, and still have the freedom to open the Bible and to do a Bible study. So Heavenly Father, as we move forward, help us to keep our eyes on you, fortify us, strengthen us, give us the Holy Spirit so that we might be obedient to all of your precepts and help us to get prepared for the great deception that is coming upon us. Lord, I ask a special blessing over everybody who is here or who will watch this video. I ask, Lord, that you would bless them with the strength to overcome any man-made traditions that have been cemented in the heart. I ask, Heavenly Father, for financial, physical, emotional, spiritual prosperity, that they might be raised up to mighty warriors for you, and that they might stand in these last days speaking truth, calling people to a relationship with Jesus and an obedience through the Holy Scriptures. So, Heavenly Father, as we move forward from this moment to the next, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for loving us so much and ask that you would hear and answer this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, we got a balloon for you. Yeah. This really cute balloon. That is really cute. It is a distortion technique. And my wife, who is very good at making this, she's going to teach it in this moment. So I want to thank you for taking the time to come to Bible study. 
I hope that you had a really uh, nice day. And so I'm going to transition from sitting here to sitting there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Just going to push this a little closer. Okay. I'm going to make a balloon for you today. I'm going to make the turtle. So it's not a quick balloon, but it's one of my favorite to make. I do enjoy making this balloon. You're going to need two, what is this, forest green, dark green, 160s, two lime green 160s, a scrap of black for the eyes, you're going to need a dark green 5 inch round, and then um, a lime green 5 inch round. Sometimes I'll use the same color, um, cause, but I like kind of like how the lime green shows through. You probably can't see it here, but I kind of like how the lime green kind of shows through when you blow it up and just gives a little different look. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a dark green 160 and we're going to kind of fold it about like that and we're going to put it inside of the 5 inch dark green balloon. We're going to blow up the outer balloon. We're going to blow up the 5 inch round. And we want to make it about as big as we're going to want the turtle um, shell to be. So, I got it about that big. And then we're going to blow up the 160 inside. So this is kind of the tricky part, is um, getting the 160 blown up without losing all of the air in the outside balloon. Okay. I'm going to try and just use my other pump. Hold on. Not going to work. Sometimes I have trouble with this 160 pump getting it started. Why is it not working? Ugh. Okay. So I have popped the 160. Hold on. Do you need a new 5 inch round? No, I popped the 160. I need a new, um, I got it. It's okay. Okay, there you go. There goes a new one. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's try again. So I just took the 160, folded it again, put inserting it inside the five inch round. I'm gonna blow up the five inch round. And now I'm gonna try again to blow up the 160. All right, it's working this time. So when you hold the um, balloon up, you can kind of see um, when that 160 goes all the way around, then you can stop um, blowing it up. You want to pull out any excess. So you pull on both ends of the balloon uh, that's inside to pull out any that's not inflated, and then tie the 160 end to end. And then I'm going to just trim the scraps of the 160. Distortion's always fun. Okay, so now I'm going to blow up the outer balloon again. I'm going to take a balloon stick and I'm going to put my lime green 5 inch. And I'm going to use, um, use the balloon stick to put the 5 inch inside the balloon. Okay. I always blow it up before I try and insert the other balloon because it just makes it a lot easier. I'm going to have to blow it up again because I lost the air when I was inserting the other one. Okay. And now 
I've got my outer balloon blown up. I'm gonna blow up the inner five inch lime green. Maybe. There we go. Okay. Now I'm gonna hold on to the nozzle of the lime green to make sure that the air doesn't escape from that. I'm not gonna tie it yet. I'm just gonna hold it while I let the air out of the dark green balloon. So if you kind of like push in, it will allow the air to come out. Okay. And I'm just checking to see if, um, I think the inside balloon is about the size I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and tie it off and then trim it. Now, I want my nozzle of my balloon to be here and it's here. So I'm gonna to have to blow up my balloon one more time, the, the outside balloon, one more time. And I'm going to push the nozzle down towards the base of the shell as I let the air out. So now you can see that my nozzle is here and not up here like it was, okay? To get the, the good distortion look, you need to get all of the um, extra inner air out. Um, so there's a technique where you can like, it, with bigger balloons, you can stretch the balloon around the bottom of the pump and use the pump to pull the air out. With the smaller balloons, that's kind of hard to do. So I'm just gonna like pull the air out with my mouse. So I'm gonna look away and do this. So. And it just kind of makes the, the bottom of it look a little more distorted when you get more of that air out. So now I'm gonna tie this outer balloon off and we are going to make some feet. So I got a lime green 160. It's gonna go a little quicker from here on out now because I'm not having to like do so much putting balloons inside balloons. So I blew this up and I got a good bit uh, at the end with about eight fingers or so at the end, tie it off. Okay. I made about a little two finger bubble, maybe one and a half fingers. I make a small, small little bubble here for the foot. So, and I'm gonna pinch twist that. So I got that. I make a spacer bubble, a little spacer bubble, and another small bubble for the other toe. And then I'm gonna make about another, well this one's about maybe two and a half, three fingers. And lock that in, tie it, and then break it. Now keep your air, because you need, you need four of these, because turtles have four feet. So tie it off. And I try and leave myself a little bit of excess here at the end to tie with when I make my next foot. And you kind of want to keep your foot handy so you can make your feet all the same size. So I'm going to make another foot. Lock it in. Before I cut it, cut it. Make another foot, one more foot, last foot.
let the rest of the air out. Okay, so now I'm gonna take another dark green 160 and I'm just gonna make a ribbon out of it. So I'm gonna grab it from the, from the, um, not the nozzle end, what is it then called, the tip? The, mm -hmm. And I'm gonna grab it from there and I'm gonna pull all the air out of it and then I'm gonna tie these to, I'm gonna tie it end to end to make a ribbon. Okay, and I've kind of, I'm gonna trim these, um, I've kind of not tied it end to end. I've left a little slack here that I'm gonna trim off. Okay. I'm gonna take my feet, and I got these two little um, ends here, scraps. I'm gonna use those and tie my feet to this ribbon. I got three feet on there so far. Here's the last one. Okay. So now I have my four feet on a ribbon. Now we're going to make the head. So I'm going to take lime green 160. going to blow it up. It doesn't really matter how much we're not going to use all of this, so I've just got about that much. Tie it off. Okay. I'm going to start by making little mini cheeks. It's very small, so I have small fingers and it's that big. There's one. And then another little cheek. Now I'm going to make about, I don't know, a two finger bubble, and then the top, I'm going to make about a four finger bubble, like that. and then I'm going to lock that in at the cheeks. Okay. That's going to be his head, so I'm going to pop the rest. I'm going to tie this off and then trim the strap. got a turtle head here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and attach the head to the shell with this nozzle. And just wrap the nozzle around several times and then I'm going to cut the rest of the nozzle off. So I just trimmed the rest of the nozzle off. Okay, last balloon you're going to need a, well not the last one because we got to do the eyes too. I got a dark green 160, and I'm gonna blow it up. Tie it off. I'm gonna wrap the 160 in here at the at, around the flower petals of the head. I'm going to do a little pinch twist right here. Okay. 
pinch twist will just sit underneath the cheeks. I'm going to take the 160 and I'm going to wrap it around the shell of the turtle and back in to the cheeks of the turtle and then cut it off. Okay, I'm going to get a scrap of black or a black 160 and I'm going to make two tiny pinch twists for the eyes. So just two little, little, little pinch twists. little pinch twist for the eyes and I'm gonna put the eyes in here on the head push it through so there is the head of the turtle now we're gonna take our feet and we're gonna wrap the feet so you kind of want to have like two in the front and two in the back but you're going to be able to arrange these um, where, where they need to go after you put it on. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to come over the head. And wrap it in. I'm going to um, wrap around the cheek one time with the string. And then the string is going to sit underneath this, the 160, so it's gonna be hidden in there. Once you got the string attached, you can move your feet. So I'm gonna kinda move this foot over and just pull, hold, on, hold on to the string and just pull your foot where you want it to finally be. good to me. There is the turtle and he sits flat on the table. So that's it. I hope you guys like it. Um, I had kind of had a little rough start there in the beginning. Like I said, it's not line work, but I really enjoy this design and I like making it. I like how I can move the feet wherever I want them to be and I like his little head. You know, the head looks really simple, and then when you put the eyes on, I like it. It looks really cute. So that's all. Um, thanks for watching. Are you ready to come close it out, Brett? Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and um, I appreciate it. If you get a chance to go back and watch the Bible study, check it out. It was a really good one. It was about the Ten Commandments and how um, you can still see that the Ten Commandments are valid in the New Testament. We did a beautiful distortion turtle with all different kinds of new techniques. Miss Krista, that was pretty awesome. And uh, my very beautiful, lovely, talented wife, thank you for taking the time to do that. And um, I hope you all have a very good uh, evening. Stay healthy physically, mentally, and spiritually. I love you guys. Have a good day.